We're wrapping up. We're, we've got two more classes to finish four years of study, uh, User's Guide for the Soul. And then we're going to start again, of course, as is our way with a new text about uh, atonement, a beautiful text also from the larger five volumes of the Tanya. So welcome. We are in chapter 53, page 828 in this edition of the Tanya. Let me just get something out of my way here and allow someone else into the class. Welcome, Paula. The big last subject that we're learning in these last three chapters of the Tanya is the question of what on earth it means, what on earth it means when we say that the Shechina is dwelling on something. We've all heard that when 10 Jews are in one place, the Shechina, God's presence somehow dwells there. It's there differently. Uh, or, or even when one person is studying Torah, the Shechina is there. We've heard this talked about. Big question is, if God is everywhere, if we know that the whole world is inside God and God is in me and God is in outer space and everything, what does it mean when the Shechina dwells? When God's presence is one place more than another place? And we've gone through uh, the whole process of understanding the difference between God's essence God's essence, which you can't point to anywhere and say, oh, there's God's essence. And yet, God's essence is everywhere equally, creating the world, versus the manifestation of God's presence, God's presence being apparent. Now there, for God's presence to be apparent, it's not God's essence itself. It's a packet of powers that come out of God, that enter into the universe and as we learn now, there's some technical terms. It enters into the Chabad, the Chachma Bin and Dad of each world. That's the Torah of each world. Torah creates a garment, and that light shines into the rest of the world. And when that light is more present, it's almost like my soul, how it is in my brain. My soul is really there in my brain. Every power is there in my brain versus in my pinky. Okay, my soul is in my pinky. It's alive. And yet the power of sight of the soul is not in my pinky. The power of thought of my soul is not in my pinky. The power of speech of my soul is not in my pinky. The power of movement is in my brain, making my pinky move. But only that light, which is required by the pinky, is shining from my brain to the pinky. Same thing with the universe. This packet of powers, which we call the Shechina, God's presence, shines into the Chabad of each world. That's like the brain of each world. And that's the Torah of each world, because Torah is God's intellect. From there, it illumines everything else in the universe. And we've been going through and looking at uh, now, when the Shekhinah came into the temple, back when we had the first temple and the second temple, what was the quality of that light? Because I'm not going to go through the whole process of how this, this flows through each of the four spiritual worlds. But eventually, you think that light now comes down to the very bottom spiritual world, shines into the Chabad of that world, that flows into Malchut of that world, the Shekhin of that world. Now that comes into the physical world, into the Holy of Holies. But we learned last week that something special happened. Because the Ten Commandments, which was God's words themselves, the Ten Commandments were actually the same, or the, the, the Ten the ten. Uh, Statements of, let's not confuse it. The Ten Commandments embody the Shekhinah. They were the words of God. When they were in the ark, that allowed God's light to flow not down through the normal process, but to flow from a much higher spiritual place, higher even than what we normally call the Shekhinah. So the temple, the first and second temple, allowed the Shekhinah to shine from much higher than even uh, the Malchut of the spiritual worlds that we've been learning about. So that, that's where we're holding. I know it's, it's a little complex, but just uh, bear with us and we'll, we'll dive into the text. We're on page 828. <laughs> Are you talking about the first tablets? Or was, the first tablets were destroyed. Huh? We're talking about the second tablets. The pieces of the first tablets were also... The pieces of the first yeah. tablets were stolen there too? Yeah, yeah. But, this is the, but first and second, they both, they both accomplished this. <laughs> They were in the first temple, they weren't in the second temple. So the difference between the first and second temple is the first temple had the physical tablets there. Second temple, it was an empty ark. They were still they were, they were buried in the catacombs to come up when- They took them out of the ark? 
Yeah, they hid them. They hid them. I thought, I thought last week you said they hid the ark. Yeah, maybe maybe the whole ark is down there. They made a new ark for the second temple, but yeah, probably uh, I misspoke. The ark from the first temple was in the catacombs. An ark they built for the second temple didn't contain the, the tablets. Very good. So we're on eight twenty eight. Eleanor, we'll start with you. Uchtei l'chakakan beluchot avanim gashmim lo yada mi madrega la madrega kederet hishtal shlut haolamot adolam hazeh agashmi. In order to engrave them on material tablets of stone, it, supernal chakma, which is Torah, did not descend decree by decree, parallel to the order of descent of the worlds, which descended by stages from a higher world to the lower world, until it reached this material. All right, so we just learned the Ten Commandments, that contains the entire Torah. Every detail of the Torah that we could ever learn was contained in uh, point form in the Ten Commandments. So everything we've learned about Torah, that it is comes from Chochmah, comes from God's intellect, and so can be a vessel for the light of the Shekhinah that would nullify the whole worlds, that applies, of course, to the Ten Commandments, which contains the whole Torah. And to engrave those words on stone, the light did not go through the normal process. When the world is being created, the light has to go all the way down through many, many stages that we've described until it can actually connect to physical reality. So it has to adapt and adapt and adapt till there's basically nothing left, just a little echo of an echo of an echo. And then it can make some physical substance. The physical stones, the tablets of the, of the Ten Commandments, first and second, they contain the words of God directly. And we know that there's, uh, there's lots of miracles. We'll discuss about them. But they actually somehow bypassed everything. Though that was God's light, not adapting to the world. But as it was in a much higher world, just leaping straight down. Just, you, you remember Star Trek with, you know, beam me down and beam me up. And they didn't have to go on a spaceship and come out. They just zzz, went right there. So if you remember Star Trek and the beaming, this was God's light beaming down from just the, a very high spiritual world and directly coming into the world without the normal accommodations that happen. So the Ten Commandments, they were a visible miracle. If you looked at them, nothing there made sense. We know that, for instance, the Ark in the Holy of Holies, it was measured as two and a half cubits, and the Holy of Holies was 20 cubits wide. But at the same time, it was in the world, it was a physical thing. At the same time, it was infinite, because it came from a place where God could bridge infinite with finite. So when you measured it, you measured it, it's two and a half cubits, yep. You measured the whole room, it's 20 cubits. You measure from one side of the arc to the wall, should be uh, the one point minus, should be 8.75 cubits, right? Instead it was 10 cubits. Can't do that math. This is right, 2.5 divided by two is 1.25. 10 minus 1.25 is yeah, 8.75, right? We're all good. So it should be 8.75 cubits here because there's 2.5 taken up. It was 10 cubits from the side to the wall. Doesn't make sense. Go to the other side of the, of the arc. 10 cubits from this side to the wall. So the whole room was 20 cubits. The arc was two and a half. But it was still 10 cubits from one side of the arc to the wall and the other side of the arc. So it was there in physical space. And yet it was infinite and couldn't be contained in physical space at the same time. And many other miracles that happened around the arc. But that miracle, and by the way, God doesn't do miracles like parlor tricks, like, hey, look at this great miracle, you know, measure this, measure this, poof, abracadabra. God doesn't do miracles just to impress us. God does miracles because that's the intrinsic identity of that phenomenon. So that's also the reason why you can read the Ten Commandments on both sides without... Exactly. Dave, let's get into that now. The Ten Commandments themselves, many miracles associated with it. One was the floating Samach and Mem. If you know what a Samach looks like or a Mem looks like, it's a circle or a square, right? So if I'm carving a tablet, imagine the movie, The Ten Commandments, I'm carving a tablet and the words are going all the way through. So I'm carving and it's, I'm not just engraving in, I'm going right through the stone. So you just see sunlight coming through the other side. I'm carving, 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 carving my letters. And now I get to, I get to a letter O in English, right? If I'm writing in English, it's like I got to an O. And now I got a problem. Well, I'm, I'm going to carve all the way through 
the stone. And when I get to the end, what's going to happen to the stone in the middle? It falls off. It's, of course, it's, it's, it's nothing holding it on. That's the normal way. It's going to fall off. You're just going to have an empty circle. Maybe that's how an O was going to look in this design. But in the tablets, no. Once that mem and sunup were carved, the stone in the middle just stayed there as if it was still part of the tablets, because it was still part of the thing. Floating. 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 What's a cubit, by the way? Cubit, uh, I think it's like this. Like it's uh, My cubit is from my wrist to my elbow. So it's a little different measurement for each person, but around that. Okay. That doesn't seem right. I got something wrong. The arc must have been bigger than that. Isn't it 18 inches? An amos is a what? An amos is a... Now, say, I got to be more... about 18 inches. Yeah, I got to be more bucky on my on my. I got to be more expert on my measurements, but the two don't seem to add up. But that's that's not the point of this class. So we can look it up after if you like. So we got to we got to the Ten Commandments. We got to the summit, and it's floating there. Now that already seems like a miracle. But then also, the tablets. If you flip them around, you didn't see the words from the back. You saw them from the front again. Right now. There's some miracles that you can that you can imagine, right? The the splitting of the sea I can imagine in my mind. It's say you know water normally flows down, but I can imagine water standing up, and this is what happened. Water changes nature, and it stood up. I can picture it. How an ark can be there and also not take up space, that I can't imagine. And how you can have words on a tablet and you flip it, and you still see the same words, and the stomach and mem are floating. If you can't imagine that, imagine there's more midrash that says the tablets actually were on all four sides of the tablets. So it wasn't just front and back. Also, if I turned and tried to look at the edge on the side, there it is again. Again, with the same words, again, with the floating summit and mem, again, seeing right through. I'm like, it's on all four sides. I mean, I'm holding tap. It's So you can't even picture this miracle in your mind. It's that out of the world. And to get back to the point I'm making, God doesn't do miracles just to impress us. God doesn't do miracles just to make a story. God does miracles because they're necessary for that phenomenon. They're intrinsic to what's being communicated or what's happening. Like, no. So the miracle, the miracle that we're talking about, it's not just there to impress us. It's there because that was the nature of the tablets. For something to come down and not be adapted to the world, to be a light that is so high that it never said, yeah, you know, I'm going to have something to do with physical reality. I'm going to make sense in time and space and all that. I'm going to have some kind of identity. For it to do that, it would have to adapt to come down. Because it didn't do that, it never adapted. It came straight down. Now, that phenomenon is just going to look like something that has no makes no sense in this world. It's in this world, finite. It's tablets. It's an arc with a size. And yet, it's infinite. And it just doesn't fit into this world. And the rules of this world don't apply. So it doesn't take up space and yet is there, right? It has a samach, both all four sides. No matter what you do, it's floating there. The thing is just, it's, it's from, it's from uh, spiritual uh, outer space in some way. Make sense? The only one that could see it would be the high priest, right? Because other people were not allowed in the Holy of Holy. That is true. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we take all this from... Uh, it's not that everybody could just walk up and see this, but we knew about it. From Ki, Olam Hazeh Hagashmi, Mitna Heg, Behit Labshut, Hateva Hagashmi. So this is the point I was making. Go ahead. Is it Doreen? And we're uh, middle of 828. Yeah, you want to unmute. You're still muted. There you go, almost, there you go. So 828.4. For this material world functions through the garb of material nature. And stay unmuted, we'll do one more. V'halukot mase elokim him. Go ahead. You want me to, well, the tablets are the work of God. Great. And one more as well. V'halmichtav, michtav elokim bu. And the writing is the writing of God. And so this was, like we said, Torah is the only thing where even though it flows right down to very physical objects, I can say, oh, this, you know, this, 
I'm not supposed to touch on Shabbat by traditional halakha, right? It's a physical object and the Torah has an opinion about it, right? I, if, if, I, if I pick something up and transfer it more than this distance, now I've moved it to another, uh, uh, another spot. And now, now that's, that's uh, not, not allowed by traditional halakha, right? I could pick up a, a, a shrimp and it's a physical shrimp. And I know this isn't kosher. We don't serve it at Temple Israel, right? That's the Torah coming right down to that physical shrimp. And it's God's chokhmah and God's ratzon, God's opinion, flowing all the way down into the physical world till it hits a shrimp. And we pick up the shrimp and we know Torah, here's the Torah saying, uh-uh, leave it for other nations to eat, right? Torah is the only thing that when it flows down to any level, even that level of the physical world, it still is exactly God's chokhmah. It still retains its identity as God's chokhmah, which shouldn't be able to enter the world. God's intellect, God's chokhmah. And so that's what's happening here. But here, the light is not adapting. Here, the light's just coming straight down from, as we'll see, uh, Malchut of Bria, which is, you know, confusing terms, right? This material functions through the garb of material nature. So anything that comes down all the way, that light has now said, I'm going to be the laws of nature. I'm going to work with time and space. But the tablets, they're the work of God and the writing is the writing of God. So that's Torah. That's God's Chochmah. And that never came down. It's in the world, but it's infinite still beyond the world. Is that why he told Mos Moshe to write down the Torah so that they could access it? Well, if I mean the first, the first tablets God wrote, right? Yeah, and the right, second tablet is since those are in the ark, and it, and God tells Moshe to write down the Torah. We can access the Torah. You say write down the Torah. You mean the whole Torah, not the Ten yeah, Commandments? Yeah. Yeah, that's part of the process of transmission. So, so, so that, we if, can access it that way, and the ark stays. Everything stays in the ark because. Yeah. So if you like, the Torah is is a signal in the air right now. Right. And I could download a big file and the file's in the signal. Right. But it's in the signal. It's just waveform. Right. I, I can't access it. Then I can get the zip file on my computer. Maybe that's the written Torah. Then I got to unzip it. That's us learning the oral Torah through through the sages that, oh, this means this. So it's a whole process. Exactly. Um, and let's go on. Lamala me'ateva shel olam hagashmi hanishpa me'harat hashchina Paula, if you want to go ahead. Okay. But the level of the supernal, no, wait, no, isn't it up here? Beyond, beyond the nature, beyond the nature. Beyond the nature of this material world, which is derived from the radiance of the Shekinah, in the shrine of the Holy of Holies of Asiya, from which light and vitality issued to the world of Asiya, in which this physical world is also included. All right, so this material, well, now we're learning how the actual material world is created. So not the Holy of Holies, not... Uh, God's Shekhinah as it's just exists above and now is leaping down below. But the normal process is the light goes down through each of these worlds. It comes into the Chabad of a world. It flows down, flows into the Malchut, the expression of that world. That creates the world. From there, a light shines down into the Chabad, the Torah, or the brains of the next world, till it gets to the lowest world. And it flows into the Holy of Holies of Asiya, that flows into Malchut of Asiya, and that should create the physical world, the normal process. Yeah, you've got, you've got a chart there if you want to look at it. But in this case, uh, Let's go ahead with uh, uh, Susan, if you'd like to read this. Yes. But the level of the supernal Chochmah of Atzilut, consisting of the totality of the Torah, as it is encapsulated in the Ten Commandments, clothed itself in the Mahut of the Atzilut, in the Bereah, 
alone and did not clothe itself in the love of other worlds, of lower worlds, excuse me. Dan, can I borrow your, your chart there? The, the handy chart you were just looking at? All right, so if you wanna, if you wanna get a visual, you know, the, the other one with the four levels you were just looking at, yeah, there you go, that'll work. All right, so we've seen this chart plenty of times. Oh, uh, focus, there you go. All right, so you've got, if this is the Ain Sulf up here, this is, this is infinite. Then you have four spiritual worlds. So normally the light comes, enters into the Chabad of this world, flows down to Malchut, creates the world, enters the Chabad of this world, creates that world, flows into that world, and finally, boom, down here, and flows into the physical world four times. Okay, we don't have this. But in this case, what happened? It just came down to Malchut of Bria alone. So this is the light in Atsilus, as we learned last week. The light of Atsilus is God's Chokma, as it is above any possible understanding. It hasn't come down to the level where it's any possibility of a created thing, like a me, and there's no possibility of intellect yet. An intellect can't understand that level. That's, that's above intellect, so it's just called Kabbalah, because it hasn't adapted even to intellect, so intellect cannot understand it. It flows down through that world, and once it hits Malchus of Bria, now, this is a very, very lofty level. Remember, the Shekhinah itself, which is the bottom of Asiya, that would nullify the whole cosmos. The physical cosmos could not withstand the light all the way down here in Malchus of the spiritual world of Asiya. Imagine up an infinite world, up another infinite world, and now you've got Malchus of Bria, which is a spiritual world where there's only intellect, there's only the possibility of created identity, but no identity itself, no form whatsoever. So this massively bright spiritual world, and that light is coming directly down into the Ten Commandments. Boom. With none of the other simtsumim, none of the other uh, blocking of the light or accommodations that happens in the many, many, many worlds below it. So this, it, it should be impossible. It should be impossible for the light of Malchus of Bria to come right into the world. And when it does, that's the Ten Commandments. That's the Ark. That's miraculous by nature, having not accommodated any of the normal form or physical substance or time-space realities of the world. It's just the light of the Bria right here. So something, something amazing really happened uh, in, in the temple. And... I know in uh, Reform Judaism, we're not so big on the temple because the idea of sacrifices, it's pretty foreign. It's kind of weird. But spiritually, if you look at what the temple represented, that something beyond the world could come into the world, that I think is something that Reform Judaism would love to explore. That there's a spirituality of this world. There's a spirituality I'm capable of. There's also the potential for God's light to enter from Malchut of Bria, boom, into the world that happened historically. And whatever happens in the messianic era that Reformed Judaism believes in and is working towards, it's going to involve that light being accessible again. Okay, whatever it looks like. Let's not argue about, is there going to be a high priest and I'm going to have to bring a, a lamb on this date? You know, that's not what this class is about. This class is about, we're all working towards a point when that light will be accessible once again to us as an entire people. Accessible us through Bria? Accessible through through uh, another arc, through through another arc with the Holy of Holies. That's that's the idea, right? So you can look at it as a physical temple that's being rebuilt, and that's kind of outside of our uh, culture. But whatever happens, whatever that looks like, there's another explanation that a spiritual temple comes down whole. What is a spiritual temple? No one understands, but something right from that world of Malch of Bria is going to descend right down into the world, and we'll have access to it again. So this class isn't about uh, arguments between denominations about what that access looks like. Are we going to build a physical temple? Is it some spiritual phenomenon? Is it beyond that? Because uh, one thing I'm sure of is that uh, my soul and your soul doesn't have a denomination. So in this class, we're just dealing with Jewish souls and the Kabbalah of how to flow as a Jewish soul through a body. And from that perspective, the Jewish people are all one people or one being. So there's, there's no, no denominations at that level, and this class is not about those uh, differences. Okay. But the level A11, is that where I am? No, I did that. 
והן לא אדן המיוחדות באור אינסוף שבתוכן, אלא סטוטו, הן נקראות בשם שכינה, השור בקודשי קדשים, דבית ראשון על ידי התלבשותה, ביוד הדיברות החקוקות, החקוקות והלוחות שבארון בנס. שריל, would you like to give us one shot? And they alone down to the bottom of the page. You want to unmute on your device. Well, I would like to give it a shot. However, I don't have that text. My, what I was sent ends on page 823. Thank you. Oh, okay. So you want, if you email Maya, she'll send you a chapter okay. 53. Okay. That was a really good job unmuting. You unmuted like <laughs> the fastest unmuter we've had in this class. It was just like, boom. Do you have like a special, you got like a big button installed on your computer. It's just like dialed right in because everybody has to like find the thing. And I know I, I do these all meetings all day long. So yeah, but congratulations. You can give, well, thank you can give you. us, give us a, a, a session on how to smoothly unmute. That was really masterful. Well, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I can't read for you though. And they loan Chachma Vatsilu as his garb in Malchut of Vatsilu and Malchut of Berea without further investment. United as they are with the infinite light of the Ein Sof that is within them, I refer to as the Shekhinah, which rested in the Holy of Holies of the first temple, through its being vested in the Ten Commandments, which were engraved by miraculous means in the tablets reposing in the ark. All right, so if you didn't hear it, and they alone, right, they alone, the Ten Commandments, which are clothed in Malta of Vasilis and Bria, so nothing else below that. <laughs> united with the infinite light that's within them. So that the Ein Sof is within the Ten Commandments. It, the Torah can contain the light of the Ein Sof. We call that the Shechina. And that's what rested in the Holy of Holies of the first temple because it was vested in the Ten Commandments, which were, as we learned, engraved. And we'll get into what that means, Chakukot, because engraving is a, a metaphor itself in the tablets in the Ark. So A... That light of the Shechina, not the normal Shechina we talk about, that the world can't withstand, but that is Malchut of the very lowest spiritual world. This is Malchut of two worlds above that, of Bria. That is directly dwelling in the Ark and the Holy of Holies because of the tablets, because those are the actual miraculous words of God. And now let's look at what it means. You talked about why is it that Moshe wrote the Torah? What did that mean? Let's, let's go back one step. Why did God engrave the Ten Commandments? What was that about? Why could the Ten Commandments just come as part of the Torah? Because they're in the Torah. So we get the Torah, the Torah, the Ten Commandments. What's the dramatic thing with the stones and the 40 days and the engraving? Why that? So what's the difference? We've talked about this possibly before between writing with ink on parchment and engraving in a rock. So just the physical differences between writing on, on parchment and engraving in a rock. So one, which is permanent. On the rock. So engraving is permanent. Writing is temporary. Why is writing temporary? It can be destroyed. Well, I can you destroy can, a rock, yeah. But, you can, yeah. But, but what can be destroyed? The right. The, 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 the parchment could burn or just. Well, even simpler. I mean, we got we got the head of our. Our Torah guardians right here, every every month, a few times if we can, we roll out the Torahs. And what do you see in the Torahs? What happens? They disintegrate, they, they, they fall off, they, they disappear, they, they, right. they, they crack. So the ink can peel off, crack. If you need repair, it can be scratched off and then rewritten. The ink and the parchment, they're one thing or they're two things? Two things. Two things. Two things. And when I write, what happens to those two things? Come together. They come together. So. It's two things that are connected, that are bonded, but it's still two things. So any two things, if they're bonded, that bond can break. The letters can come off, they can be scratched off. That's what writing is. So when you write something, that means God's chokhmah, the ink, is on the parchment, on the world. But you know what? It's, it's two things that have been put together. And by the way, they take apart. They need to be put back together. Now look at engraving. When I engrave a letter on a stone, are there two things? <clears throat> No, it's part of the, becomes part of the stone. It doesn't even become part of the stone. It just is stone. There's not a second thing that becomes. Right. It, it is the stone. Yeah. The stone is a stone. I engrave it in, and the stone always was a stone, still is a stone. It's just one thing. And so in terms of something actually becoming 
I'm not saying becoming, being integrated, being an integrated part of something. Writing is one level where God's Chochmah is bonded with the world, but it's bonded as a separate thing that can come off. Engraving, God's Chochmah is the world. It's not something separate that, that becomes, that becomes a part of it. And that is the advantage. That is the advantage of the process of engraving the Ten Commandments was that God's Chochma through Torah was able to come all the way down till it wasn't just joined to the world. It actually was the world. And the world itself was able to completely absorb God's Chochma such that there was no two entities that had to be joined. And that was the beauty of receiving the Torah and the Ten Commandments to begin with, was that God's infinity was able to now come and become exactly one with the lowest aspect, the physical aspect of the world, not as a separate thing, but actually part absorbed in and inseparable from the physical world, right? That's engraving. And that, that's, that's this idea that that light actually comes down and hits the very physical world. That's, that's the Ten Commandments. Yes? Well... What you said before that it was no matter how you turn the stone or how you maybe walk around the stone, it you could read in all directions. Writing is just two dimensional, but the other one is no matter where you are, you you read it. It is there. It becomes then part of you. You cannot go away from the Torah. Everyone that's anywhere near it has has uh, reads it and it becomes part of them. Very good, very nice insight, Stuart, that it's not just that the Torah, the Ten Commandments are so imparted to the world, it's that there is no perspective from which it's not relating to you and, and reaching you, right? A Torah, which is written, is two-dimensional, so I'm there reading it, you're standing over there, you're not even seeing it, you're just getting it through me, right? You're, you're upside down, you're getting the letters upside down. It's not reaching you in the correct way. You're, you're behind, you're seeing the back of the parchment, <clears throat> right? The Ten Commandments, as Stuart pointed out, there was no perspective from which it was not hitting you exactly the same way with the writing, the miraculous Ten Commandments. Wherever you're standing, it hit you, and you weren't looking at the back, and everyone saw the same miracle. So a beautiful, a beautiful uh, example, a beautiful extension of the same point. I see this as kind of metaphoric because when it talks about the ark and god's presence it talks about dwelling um, among within among them yeah right i don't know i have the exact words yeah but what it what i gathered from it was that it was on their hearts and the part of their internal functioning and that it wasn't that it was a separate stone necessarily that was in the box forget that it was in them it was engraved on their hearts. It was within them. Yeah, and that 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 section, you know, take take is really take me as a sacrifice as a language. Is that God God's self is actually in that? It's not just it's not just uh, God's wisdom. But it's in, it's inseparable, in, and it, and in it's me. right in us, engraved in us. like yeah. like we're the the commandments. Yeah, I, I mean, I just see that whole thing as a metaphor. It absolutely is, absolutely, is. and that's that gets us to exactly what we said. <laughs> The Torah is referred to as Mashal HaKadmoni. It is the original, <clears throat> the um, primordial metaphor. So if the world is a series of stories that higher and higher intelligence is trying to relate to us until it gets down to us and the story we're getting looks like I woke up this morning, I, 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 I prayed a little, I had some breakfast, I came here, you know, my car, my this... I'm dealing with the physical world. That's a story, but that's a metaphor for something higher. And that higher world is a metaphor for something higher. And however many stories you try and layer on top to get to higher and higher wisdoms, there's one metaphor that's contained in every single one. That's the original metaphor. That's Mashal HaKadmoni. And that's, that's what Torah is. Torah is, as you just said, Noreen, Torah is... God putting God's self into a story, into a metaphor. And now, however low it flows, that original metaphor, God, the Ain Sof, is still in the story down here. So I'm reading Torah and I'm reading about, uh, I'm reading about uh, you know, how many, uh, I'm reading about the right way of slaughtering something and that you have to spill the blood on the ground. I understand that physical stuff, but it's 
It's Mashal Hakad Moni. It's, it's an original metaphor. And God is still in this story that I can put into my physical brain. I can understand with my intellect. I can understand with my emotions. And I can actually do it with my physical hands. And yet, <clears throat> I have God's actual chokhmah right in there. God's total identity. What's Kadmoni like in English? Kadmon is is Kadmon is is prescribed is transcri- uh, translated as of old, you know, ancient, but also it means primordial, like like the the prime of the first. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Next page. Ma se no. Um, no, we did that. Yeah, I did too. No, is there a debate as where we are? Where I refer to as the ship. I don't know what page you're on. Therefore, I did through uh, no. Baron Hannes reposing in the yard. No? I just read. You read all this stuff. Oh, did I? Yeah, you went right, okay, to the, okay. right to the bottom of the page. Yeah. Oh, okay. All this stuff here actually doesn't help. Me. Yeah. Okay, good. For once, for once, I remembered where I was. <laughs> Moreover, the Ten Commandments upon the tablets. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we just didn't we just go through that? Let's let's agree. Let's agree we're there. I think we're there. It's good enough to repeat. Go ahead. Oh, we're repeating it? <laughs> no. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we might need a pause break here. Like, 831? 830. 830. We haven't done anything. Oh, okay, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Should I go ahead? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Thanks. Now, moreover, the Ten Commandments upon the tablets were the work of the living God, Elohim Chaim. This being. This being in terms of the Svirot Bina of Absolute, which is known as the concealed world, which nests in the world of Berea, as is known to the students of the Kabbalah. Right, so you remember, if you hear three or four classes ago or more, we went through many names of the Shechina, right? One of them was, was Ama Diskalia, the revealed world, because below, below that level, everything is just godliness. Right? There's nothing. And finally, when it gets to Malta of Atsilus in this case, now it's energy that is intended to relate to a world, but above that, it's just godliness. Nothing, there's nothing, it's completely hidden. So this is the Ten Commandments are Alma Discassia, they're, they're the hidden world. They're they're above that, which nests in Bria, right? That light, that light shines within Bria, God's intellect. Right, Stuart, if you want to go ahead, ask for the second to the bottom of the page. As for the second temple in which the ark and the tablets did not repose, these being among the, the five things found in the first temple and lacking in the second. A rabbi of blessed memory said that the Shechina did not abide there. This means not that God forbid the Shechina did not abide there at all. Rather, it speaks of the category of the Shechina which used to abide in the first temple, which was not in the manner of the ordinary descent of the worlds. Right. So then then there's another another, uh, reality, which is in the second temple, where there wasn't an ark and there wasn't tablets, just no, nothing there, the rabbi said, the Shechina didn't abide there. The Shechina didn't abide there. Horror. This, it stood for 420 years. I mean, uh, the second temple, and it was destroyed. It put us into exile. This is, this is the temple, the biggest, most beautiful structure, the, the envy of the ancient world. The Shechina didn't abide there. What they really mean is, the level of the Shechina that was in the first temple didn't abide in the second temple. But the Shechina 
that abided in the second temple was also beyond the normal level of screen of the world, as he'll describe. It just zipped down, so to speak. It beamed down from a lower level than the Shekhinah that was in the first temple. And when you have these leaps of infinity, basically, compared to the Shekhinah of Malchut Abriya, it was just now physical reality. It wasn't there. But if you look at what was there in the second temple, that was still a level of Shekhinah that's beyond what appears anywhere else in the world. Let's, let's look at it. Ela. Go ahead, but in the second. But in the second temple, oh. it abided accordingly to the to the order of gradual descent, the Mahut of Atsira, vested in the Mahut of Bria, and the latter in Mahut of Atsira, and the latter in the shrine of the Holy of Holies of Atsira, that, that shrine being called Kamar of Atsira. So you have the lowest spiritual world is Asiya, the holy of holies of that, Chabad of that lowest world. That's still a massive leap higher than Malchut of that world, the bottom of that world. And it was as the Shekhinah was uh, entered into the Chabad of that world, it went directly into the second temple where, where there wasn't uh, actual physical stones. But in the first temple, the Bible. And the first temple came from 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 Malchut of Bria. The second temple came from Chabad of Asiya. So so, it's it's a big two jumps lower, but it's still much higher than than the way it appears right now as we're learning Torah. The Shina is dwelling here, but it's not the Shina of, of Chabad of Asiya. It's just Malchut of Asiya. But that also is too much for the world to endure without without the uh, without the the garment of Torah for it to flow into. Because Torah can contain it. And that, yeah. Yeah. And that, I was just reading one where they said after every, like after the temple was destroyed, the first temple, we got the Torah. And it was actually written down, you know, date wise. And after each destruction, we got like the Mishnah came. And chronologically, that's how they, you know, put that in years. Yeah. And so I think. The fact that um, so the Holy of Holies, it, it wasn't there, it was a lesser Shekhinah, but you had something else to replace it. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, very yeah. true, very true. And there's another concept that's good to understand, which is called Maiver, Maiver, which means uh, something that passes through but doesn't belong there. Maiver is something that passes through Maiver. but doesn't belong there. Like for instance, uh, say I was a great scholar. I'm not not the uh, you know the, the everyday kind of kind of uh, learner that I am, and I have a lot of Torah in my brain, and I'm writing a great Torah thought, and I'm writing it with my hand, and my hand is writing the Torah thought. So you know, a child would look at the hand and say, "Wow, that's a really brilliant hand. Look at the Torah thought that hand is writing." Right? The hand really has learned a lot of Torah. We know it's just passing through my hand. If I'm a scholar, I'm thinking the thought, my hand is writing it. Yeah, it's, it's going through my hand, but it's not contained in my hand. It doesn't belong in my hand. My hand doesn't understand the Torah. It's not explaining the Torah. It's just passing through directly without, without really relating to the hand. That is how the light of God passed down to Bria in the case of the first temple. It didn't go through the regular uh, cascade and shielding. It just went boom, straight there, and then boom, straight down. And as it was passing through all those high spiritual worlds, it still was passing through just without adapting to them, right? So the, uh, the opposite is hitlapshus. We call it hitlapshut, right? When something is enclosed in something, now it adapts to the thing. Now it belongs in the thing. Now it's by enclosing in, it's revealing something of itself in that thing. It's, it's there. So the way, the way that the light normally works, it adapts to the world and it encloses itself in the world until it becomes physical stuff. But the light that was coming down through the tablets was just Derek Maiver, was just, was just passing through and was not contained in the garments that it was passing through as it came. Didn't all of this happen though prior to the first temple? 
yeah, the tablets were in front of the first temple. And, and, but they were also there in the tabernacle. So when we had that tent in the desert, so the Holy of Holies there was also the Shekinah dwelling there. So when you talk about the first temple, you're also talking about all the time from Sinai through the first correct. temple. Correct, and Shiloh and all the other places. So oh, correct. So, so the, the point is, it didn't start when, 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 when start Solomon built the first temple. Sorry, when, uh, yeah. When Solomon built the first temple, it didn't, uh, it didn't start there. That Shekinah had been in the tabernacle and all the other locations and, and wherever the ark and the tablets were, that Shekinah was dwelling there. Um, let's start again with Eleanor, please. And we're at the and the holy of holies. Uh, yeah. Of Asia was clothed in the holy of holies of the temple below. In it rested the Shekinah, that is the Mahut of Yasira, which was clothed in the holy of holies of Asia. And so the whether it had that extra skip or not from the first or second temple, that upper higher world Shekinah entered the physical Kodesh HaKadoshim directly. It, that was basically Chochmah of Atzilus, Chochmah of the high spiritual world, passing down Derech Maiver, passing down without being clothed or relating, straight to Malchut of Bria, and then straight to the tablets. And that was the light of Chochmah of Atzilus coming down directly there. So if you, if you actually think about what was happening in the Holy of Holies, because that light contained also the light for everything else in the physical cosmos, that was the nerve center of the entirety of creation. Right? You traveled, you traveled you know, across, the, across the globe to somewhere in Russia and, and there's someone living in a hut and they're eating a bowl of soup. The light that is creating that bowl of soup and that hut and that person, that is all contained in whatever it is that is coming down directly into the Holy of Holies. It's coming there first. And all the light that finally creates the physical world, every micron of it, that is contained there. So you walk in and the place was just intrinsically miraculous. You sensed everything happening in the world. It's, it's vibrating here right now. And, and, and this is my source as well. And that was plainly visible, whatever that means. So just a very, very miraculous place. Let's... Uh, yeah, let's get to the bottom of the page, and then we'll do a little meditation. Uh, go ahead, uh, I think, uh, Paul, correct? Oh, Doreen, Doreen, it's your turn now. Okay, therefore, because the Shekhinah resided in the temple's Holy of Holies, no man was permitted to enter there except the high priest on Yom Kippur. And since the destruction of the temple of which the sanctuary was a part, God resides in the shrine of the Holy of Holies of Torah and of the Mitzvot, for as mentioned earlier, the Shekhinah must reside in the Holy of Holies. And, let, and let's do one more. HaKodesh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, has but, but the four cubits of Halacha alone. So this last point of today, it shows on the one hand, this level of, of Malchut of Bria coming down directly into the physical world, not adapting to the physical world, it has an obvious advantage. This is, this is God's Chochmah as it is in this higher spiritual world that is coming directly here. We can somehow access it, but we can't really access it because there's nothing to do with us. So really, as you said, Stuart, only the high priest and only on the most holy day of the year, so only the holiest spot, the holiest soul, and the holiest time, when they came together, that's when we could reach out and enter and touch and connect with this phenomenon, because it was so beyond. But 
when we sit down right now and learn Torah, the Shekhinah dwells here also. Now, yeah, it's a lower Shina. Yeah, it's not Shina from the crazy higher worlds, but there's an advantage to this too, in that it, it's not just the high priest on the holiest day in the holiest place. This is anybody anywhere. We can sit here, relax. You and I, or, or, or you out, out in, in, uh, on the virtual space in, in, in your place and time, we can sit here and learn Torah. We can discuss physical objects and the, the light of God actually adapts. Right? It actually uh, comes all the way down to the physical elements of the Torah, whereas in the temple, the Shina never adapted to creation beyond its level, right? the first temple and the second temple. It was just, it, it came straight from there. So there's an advantage to, of course, the Shina as it was in the temple. But if you think of the advantage that we have, that the Shina comes all the way down into physical reality, and God's Chochmah is right there, and that we can take and talk about and absorb and think about and learn, that is that is an advantage perhaps beyond what happened in the temple because we can just access it at any point and like the engraving in the ten commandments god's welcome has come right down and become exactly one with the physical world so we we can reveal it here so what was the point then of the um the high priest going in on young kippur i mean first of all connecting with holiness second of all atoning for sins uh, so many, many points. And of, you know, representative of the Tony percent. Yeah, I mean, actually, Tony percent. Yeah, yeah. And let's. Uh, we didn't meditate last week, so we, we like to include a little meditation for the end because this wants to, uh, of course, enter into our brains and create emotions. That is Jewish meditation. If you find yourself in a comfortable position, let it, let it a crex if you need to crex. A little, uh, just let it out. There you go. <laughs> And let's slow our breathing down. And if you're comfortable breathing through your nostrils, it flows nicely that way. Let's slow our breathing down until it has four stages. We're going to count four to breathe in, then four to hold the breath in, four to release the breath again through the nostrils, four to remain empty. So start with me breathing in on one, two, three, four, stay full, two, three, four, breathing back out, two, three, four, and staying empty, two, three, and back in again, one, two, three, four, nice and full, two, three, we are breathing out, two, empty. Continue that pat on your own. I hear nice breathing in this room. And let's open up what we call our wisdom gateway. So the space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. Empty space between the end of the in-breath and beginning of the out-breath, let that open. That will be our wisdom gateway as we continue the breathing cycle. We'll sort of stay there you know, from a soul perspective. Let's place in that wisdom gateway, this divine concept. As we're learning Torah, as we have right now, the Shekhinah is dwelling over us. As we're learning Torah, the Shekhinah is dwelling over us, over our minds, over our physical mouth and tongue and teeth that are speaking. And that's a light, that's a light that in and of itself would dissolve the entire cosmos. Because we're, we have Torah, we can let it enclose and let it enter into our minds, into our speech and the shina, that, that light we're discussing is dwelling right here. So let that fill your wisdom gateway. So Jewish meditation is more what we'd call contemplation. We want our mind to fill rather than empty, fill with the details of this divine image.
kind of sounds allow those to enter. It's on a screen that's further away, bring it super close, super big and colorful. Maybe enter into the screen so you are you are within it. As always, track any changes emotionally that are happening. Track any awakening of a sense of love, a sense of awe. As we generate those divine, divine soul emotions through this profound meditation. Feel free to pause your device and stay in this meditation for 5, 10, 15 minutes. If you're with us, let's wiggle our fingers, open our eyes. Yashikoch, it's wonderful to have you. As I said, we will have one more class. Is today the first day of El? No, first day of El Rosh Kashel is Shabbat and then Sunday. So, so that's coming and uh, you want to blow up, blow a shofar every day, list of that. Really start getting into where I'm at and how I failed, how I can be better. This is El. So Anilu Dodi Vadodi Li, God is for me and I'm for God. And so we really are reaching out in a more personal way. So it's, it's, it's Saturday, uh, Friday night. Uh, Friday night, Saturday night. Those, those two days, those, those are the two days of Rosh Chodesh this month. Uh, you don't blow a shofar on Shabbat, but you, so on Sunday morning you blow a shofar. Yeah, but Kaluzi is doing a class on Saturday. On Saturday morning, yeah. 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 Very nice, very nice. Uh, and, and we will also, uh, we have one more class to uh, get through the, the uh, next section of this last chapter. And then on, is it the 15th? Yes, Thursday, the 15th. it is the 15th. Thursday, September 15th, we're gonna have a nice seum, a nice celebration at my house. So if you'd like to be there in person, please email my at temple-israel.org. If you've been part of our class at any point of the, point of the last four years, you're most welcome, anyone's welcome. And uh, we'll, we'll sit, we'll have a l'chaim, we'll finish this chapter, we'll start a new text, and uh, we'll uh, start learning about tshuva. It says Thursday, the 8th. The 8th, we don't have a class. No. We have a class on the 1st. Oh, the 15th, okay. The 8th, there's uh, some high holiday work I gotta do, so I wasn't available. Okay. And then the 15th, that will be our celebration, again, at my house. So email Maya at temple-israel if you'd like to attend, we'd love to have you. Saigazun, be good, and signing off. Mm -hmm. Find this last chapter.